Welcome to the Cincinnati Zoo. The only park I know of that welcomes its members with a red carpet pushed by a miniature pig. Today, we are going dark inside Night Hunters. Where the sun is down, crickets and cicadas sing all around, and the graphics will make you speak in poems even after you leave. There's only a handful of nocturnal houses out there, but when you find one, it usually means you're going to run into creatures that are both adorable and rarely found in other zoos. This dates back to 1952, but people still know it as 1985's historic cat house. In 2011, the zoo combined half of the cat house animals with the best of the old nocturnal house. They brought those animals over here, took the carpet out, and turned off the lights. So you'll probably see it like this, but we'll be seeing it like this. So let's begin. Night Hunters is located right across from the Gorilla World. And as you make your way towards it, I imagine if you're from around here, you reminisce of the old cages that lined up against this garden all the way to the entrance. Not even five steps in, greeting us at the door are tawny frog mouths, a Capra Moljiform of Australia. But not a visit goes by where I don't hear someone refer to them as an owl. Though I don't entirely blame my fellow Greek chili eaters because this had a spectacled owl and a Eurasian eagle owl that's now in Cat Canyon. That was an add-on exhibit, but the next few are blasts from the past. If you don't find what you're looking for in the Himalayas, just go next door to an exhibit that somehow once displayed a snow leopard. Look up to the left and you might see a palace cat. They're as big as an ordinary house cat, but they live far from ordinary lives. The only way you'll find them in the wild is if you're thousands of feet above sea level in Central Asia where they experience temperatures of minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Good thing they're fitted with the most dense fur of any other cat by size ratio. Cincinnati's displayed them for as long as I can remember. And about a decade ago, they became the first place ever to breed the palace cat using artificial insemination, back when the zoo was known for that sort of thing. Next is a line of the building's biggest habitats. Now if hearing the words snow leopard caught you off guard, imagine seeing a mountain lion in here. But these days this American western theme is a backdrop for their aardwolves, the lesser known fourth member of the hyena family, native to east and southern Africa. So no, they aren't wolves or even dogs at all, but they do act like aardvarks. Unlike their carnivorous cousins, they don't eat large animals. Aardwolves are insectivores. Their tongue is specially adapted to withstand tons of bites from invertebrates. They can eat up to 250,000 termites in just one night. If you're watching this from the States, good chance you haven't heard of this before. Well, there's a reason. These are known as the zoo's rarest animals from a certain point of view. While somewhat more popular in Europe, Chippo and Changa are the only aardwolves on display in America. The next display is a little hard to look through, in a good way, because it has so many tree limbs. And after years of trying, I finally got a good look at their bear cats. One of our city's mascots. They're not bears, and they aren't cats, but they're in the same family as Janets, Civets, and Mongooses. And to keep adding to this oddity, they have the tail of a monkey, one of the few mammals on the right side of the planet with a prehensile tail that acts as a fifth limb to help them climb. This animal of Southeast Asia was first cared for in the US by San Diego back in the 30s. And to an extent, they're still kind of unheard of, but they are more popular in zoos than you'd think. So we'll definitely be running into the Bearcat on other tours. Now, most animals in here cause words of affection, but every now and then, this next one will cause a scream. The Vampire Bat. Not all of you might find these adorable, and that's okay. But did you know that they can actually help us? Using their sharp incisors, vampire bats eat by puncturing the skin of their prey, which is typically livestock. 
and they lap up the flowing blood. Their saliva contains an enzyme that keeps that flow going so they have more to eat. Now nothing's official, but there are talks of using that enzyme to treat stroke and heart attack victims and with regular usage, it may be able to stop blood from ever clotting again. And that's just another reason why vampire bats don't deserve such a bad reputation. Straight across, in the 2011 upgrade, the zoo added these two triangles. The back walls used to be see-through, but a predator and prey setup doesn't really work with bear cats and pottos, who I haven't seen in here in years. Good thing though, we'll see them another time in another part of the zoo. The back window in the second display used to give a preview of an odd nocturnal house trio. First, a greater bush baby that I've seen like twice. If you go over to the den on the left, there's a 99% chance you'll meet an aardvark's backside, but every so often you'll get a chance to be face to face. And if you look above them, it's impossible to miss the Indian flying foxes, classified as a mega bat for its four foot wingspan, but they don't go after blood. They're mostly frugivores and forage for nectar and juice from fruits and flowers. And like the vampire bat, you have absolutely no reason to fear them either. So I mentioned snow leopard and mountain lion. Now visualize a jaguar in this temple themed jungle. Eventually the zoo went with something a little smaller, a Brazilian ocelot. South America's most famous small cat, and though found in a large number of diverse habitats, no matter where it is, they're still being threatened with deforestation and road mortality that's putting their population on a decline. Fortunately, at least, they are still not considered endangered. Now near the corner is another add-on, originally for a Burmese python, then a rat snake, then a pato. Now a three-banded armadillo. But with all this dust for hiding, all I have to say is good luck finding it. At the end of the hull, representing the southern parts of Africa, dubbed a remorseless killing machine, the black-footed cat. They're so dedicated to getting a meal that they'll remain motionless for up to two hours, waiting for prey to appear. They've been known to kill up to 10 rodents and birds on a single night with a 60% success rate, winning them the title, the world's deadliest cat. And people don't just get surprised when they hear those facts, but also when they learn that this is as big as a black footed cat gets. To their right is something just as cute, but still almost just as deadly. Under this burlap sack is an Arabian sand cat, superbly adapted to a harsh life in the desert. They inhabit dry plains and rocky valleys of Africa, Sahara, Arabian Peninsula, and other parts of Western Asia, where surface temperatures can reach 124 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and as low as 31 degrees at night. But that's not a problem for the sand cat. They have extra fur and padding on their feet to protect them against the intense heat and the cold. They can even go for weeks without a sip of water, but there's no need to go looking for it because they get hydrated when they eat their prey. Much like their neighbors, just about everyone here mistakes them for a domestic cat, though I should say kitten, but this is a fully grown sand cat. But again, I don't blame the crowd. They have the looks. They're just as curious and playful, and if you're filming, sooner or later, cat owners will start jumping in front of your shots, asking if we can adopt one. And I always say, just like any other wildcat, they don't make good pets. Down the final hallway, hopefully you'll stop for a sec by a display that discusses the importance of small cat conservation. And then, enter the rotunda. The location of the old small mammal house and a circle of our final seven stops to start it. Well, since they're in another exhibit, we'll save it for later and stop by an enclosure that was once split in two. Look for Shigua, the clouded leopard, a species that's been in this building for decades. And this won't be the last time we see one, but it might be the last time we ever see one inside. According to the books, she is 18 years old, 
switches several years over this cat's average lifespan. So getting around isn't as easy as it once was, which is why she switched spots with the bear cats to give her more ground room. Now I promise this isn't a paid promotion, but if you do get a membership, you can come to the zoo really early and maybe you'll catch her hanging out down here. And you might be able to say you interacted with a clouded leopard. Now coming from neither the cat or nocturnal house, but from the jungle trails, the large spotted Janet, another specimen that resembles a cat. But as I threw out there earlier, they are in the same family as the bear cat. As you could have guessed, their lightweight, slender build and retractable claws make them expert climbers and are well adapted for the arboreal life, where they hunt for birds and forage for fruit. But that doesn't mean they're not fit for the terrestrial lifestyle either. This solitary viverid will come down to the forest floor hoping to snag a rodent and maybe even take on a snake. They're about as common to see them in the African woods about as much as they are in US parks. You can find them at, I believe, six AZA institutions. So this could possibly be the last time we get this good of a look at the large spotted Janet. Kicking off the rotunda's other side is the Fennec Fox, the world's smallest fox. And they sport the largest ears relative to the size of their body than any other canid. And good thing too, because on some visits, that's all you're able to see. The display next door, the fox's former home, also has a spotted genet. And the last renovation I mentioned lowered the front of this habitat to create an underwater viewing so we could see a fishing cat hunt. But they've since passed and another ocelot has taken over. Closing out and beginning the circle in the old bobcat forest and the former caracal cliffs lives the ringtail. If you asked me where in the world do they live, and it was my first time seeing one, I probably would have told you they roam the high canopies of a tropical rainforest. But it's the opposite. The ringtail prefers the canyons and dry oak forests throughout most of Mexico up to the south and southwestern United States. In fact, legend has it they were must-have pets for gold rush miners, using them to rid their work and living space of mice and other rodents. Rodents, and they gave them their other names, the Miners or Ring-Tailed Cat. Pest control may be one of the many traits they share with a house cat, but these guys are relatives of the raccoon, which is evident in their facial features and their vertical climbing skills. They can rotate their hind feet 180 degrees, giving them a good grip as they go both up and down head first. When you go back outside and let your eyes adjust, I highly recommend you take a left to get face to face with our beloved mountain lions and the rest of the Cat Canyon animals. Eventually you'll make your way around the building to an old cage and a bobcat I've yet to see. The Night Hunters is one of the country's few nocturnal houses filled with a few rarities we will probably never see on this channel again. So if this didn't convince you to come and visit the Cincinnati Zoo, well then I can think of a few other exhibits here that will. Stay tuned, support your local zoo, and thank you for watching.